Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, your journey, our passion. And by the all-new 2015 Jeep Renegade. This is Auto Line After Hours with John McElroy, episode 286 for May 8th of 2015. Autonomous technology takes a great leap forward. Watch AutoLine After Hours live at AutoLine.tv every Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. That's 12 p.m. Pacific or 19 hours GMT. You can subscribe to this podcast for free by searching for AutoLine in iTunes, Stitcher, or YouTube. Gary Vassalash. We're here again. We are. First day of spring, I think. First, first day I came to the studio for, since I can't remember when, with no jacket. Wow. It's that warm outside. There's no snow on the ground. There's no snow on the done. ground yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah it's early. So I just came back from Las Vegas, Las Vegas, Red Eye. We'll talk about that we'll in a little bit. We'll talk about that in a minute. But we got to tell everybody who else is here. We have Stephanie Brinley with us. Yep. IHS Automotive, Senior Analyst for um, North and South America. Great. And we have Todd Lawson. Hello, Motor Todd. Trend Magazine. Automobile Magazine. Automobile Magazine. Gosh. Dang it. And I'm a Detroit and, and bureau it's chief. It's not the first time I've done that mistake. I, hey, you know, you know what? I did that myself hard. recently at, at an APA uh, luncheon, so <laughs> okay, uh, I couldn't it, believe I, I did it. It's been hope two and a half years. Hope your boss didn't hear that. Yeah. <laughs> no. Gosh dang it, one of these days I'll get it right. Now, some viewers may say, hey, wait a minute, where's your special guest? Because on Monday we did say we were going to have Craig Metros, the chief exterior designer for the Ford GT on today's show. But he done got yanked. And, uh, Todd, you were saying they've got some press conference Monday. There's, there, yeah, there's a press event uh, on, on Monday, and I, I suspect that uh, maybe they just didn't want yeah, to be there until after. Right. That event. We get them next month. Yeah, but, so yeah. if anybody's saying, hey, I thought you guys were going to have the Ford GT, not yet. Just hold on. <laughs> You gonna bring the car in the? Uh, in I the don't video? think we'll get a car. Won't be able to do that. No, uh, no. not I, yet. I, I, not runners yet for one thing. Yeah, I think maybe there's two in the world, yeah. and uh, yeah. and one of them's foam. <laughs> right. Well, it makes it lighter, so it, it does. does. Yeah. It does. This person could carry it into the studio. <laughs> they and could. They bring it in the back of an F one hundred and fifty. So we got a lot of different topics that we want to touch on in the show, but I want to start out talking about Denise McCluggage because she just passed away yesterday at age 88. And I'm sure all of us know her and have nothing but good things to say about her because Denise was one of my favorite people in this business. I had the pleasure of working with her. I was at Auto Week from 96 to 2000 and for a short while, for about a year, year and a half, two years, something like that, I was um, in charge of editing the columns and she was in the column rotation. And uh, she was just a delight to work with as, you know, uh, one other columnist was very good about taking suggestions about calling back and saying, okay, I see why you need to fix this. A few others, not so much, but she was just, uh, she was wonderful. So we're seeing, we're seeing woman. pictures of Denise here, and, and I think that for those who don't know who she is, I mean, we do, obviously, but I mean, she, she raced cars. I mean, she, she was at Sebring. and uh, She was a professional um, race driver, right. a woman, back in the 1950s and 60s. Rallied, her, rallied that mini, I believe, yeah. yeah. Right. She, so, she was a trailblazer. Trailblazer, amazing life. If I was going to redo it all over again, God, would I have loved to have been so, and she, there. And she kept at it. I mean, this was the interesting thing. Yep. She kept driving. There's hey. John in, in her house, right? Right. In and she house. had no ego about it either. She was just mm -hmm. very, very easy, easygoing, great to talk with um, there's person. There's yeah. program talking to David Schmidt. And, and really an intellectual, talking, too. Yes. I mean, she could talk on a, a wide variety of topics and very competently, very knowledgeable. Mm -hmm. She was hired, she, she worked for, uh, I want to say, might not have been the Herald American, but one of the defunct uh, New York u newspapers in the 1950s, and she covered auto racing and uh, downhill skiing. And uh, then she started... And I think she was an accomplished skier, too. Uh, yes, well, she lived in Santa Fe for many of the last few decades. That's where you and, saw her, right? Santa Fe? Yeah, that's what, yeah, what, that little clip that you just saw of me in her house, that was in Santa Fe, right? Yeah, and she's, she's um, credited f for being one of the founders of what was then Competition Press and Auto Weekly. Mm. So she started there. She worked for them uh, all the way th for her entire life, basically. I mean, since f uh, helping found the magazine. And, uh, you know, I, I was lucky to be on a few trips 
trips with her, the first time I drove with her anywhere. And this is after editing her stuff for about a year, so I finally got a chance to meet her in person. And uh, she was the one, not, not me, but we were driving a Dodge Dakota of all things. And this was in Arizona, and she was the one where the, the cop lit up the lights to warn her to slow down. Uh, <laughs> Because she drove like that. Oh, I know. All her life. Look, uh, my favorite Denise McCluggage story goes back years ago when Ford first came out with the the Focus SVT, and you know SVT did all this high performance stuff. They decided to do a high performance Focus. It's still a Focus, right? I mean, you know, at the end of the day, yeah, they put some nice wheels and they put a little spoiler on it and some. It was a little faster, stuff. yeah. And it went a little bit faster, but. But it was kind of an invisible car. If you just looked at it, and if you didn't know what you're looking at, you'd just think, oh, it's a Ford Focus. So we, the, the event started in Pasadena, and we had to drive out to Willow Springs. And as you guys know, there's some really nice mountain roads on the way out there. So she's driving. I'm riding shotgun with her, and we catch up to this traffic. And we're going slow because no place to pass. It's just two lanes there. And every now and then you get to where it opens up. There's a passing lane, and you can go. But as we're driving along behind this traffic, she looks in the rearview mirror and she goes, whoa, what's this? And there's some guy in an Acura Vigor two inches off our back bumper. Like, you know, like, like get going, get going, get going. And she's looking at this guy like, what an idiot. You know, we, you know, we can't go anywhere. You can't go anywhere. So this goes on for a couple of miles and he's right on our, on our ass. So we get to one point where there's a passing lane and this guy boom, goes riding past us. Because you know, he's got a much more powerful car, even though it is an SVT Focus. So now Denise says, we'll show him. <laughs> now she's two inches off his bumper, and there's no traffic. So this guy's going faster and faster and faster through all these mountain road turns up and down and other, in the desert and the mountains. And I'm watching him grinning from ear to ear because every time he looks up, there's this little old lady in a Focus two inches <laughs> off his ass. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, he got so angry about it, he could not shake her, could not shake her at all, no matter what he did, no matter how fast he went. He literally just threw his car off at the side of the road, spinning out, and, and as his car is spinning out and com coming to a stop, I see him look up, open mouth, agape, and we go by, and it's this little old lady in a focus. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, there's that famous story about when she was on a drive program and she got pulled over by the cops for speeding. The uh, Mercedes story? Yeah. Oh, okay, oh. thanks. Uh, well... The way, they, the way I heard it, and I actually uh, confirmed this with her because it almost sounded apocryphal. And this was probably 15 years ago or so, and it was a Mercedes C-Class AMG, like a 36 or a, uh, what, 45 or whatever the next one was. And, and of course, Mercedes being Mercedes painted them all silver. And uh, the story is that they, they were somewhere out west, and they, uh, a bunch of them went by a, uh, a cop car that was stationary. The uh, Fife pulls out and chases them down, find, and she pulls into traffic where there are other silver Mercedes AMGs. And uh, the cop finds her, pulls her over, walks up to the door, and says, Do you know how fast? Uh, I'm sorry, did you see a car just like yours going by at 85 miles an hour? <laughs> and her answer was, Why, yes, officer, I did. <laughs> And, and, and to add to her legend of another another cop story, so I was on a, a Mazda program, and we were we were at Laguna Seca, the Mazda Speedway at Laguna Raceway, whatever it's called at Laguna Seca. But so part of the thing was is that we would take cars and then just drive, you know, around Monterey. And so Denise took a car out, and uh, Denise came back in, and she had this this grin on her face, and we we're like, well, what happened? Well, while she was driving, she started getting chased by a cop. <laughs> And she lost the cop. <laughs> <laughs> so, so she was a hell of a good driver. Yes, she and, was a uh, hell of a good driver. And, and yes. she knew a tremendous amount about the auto industry. And uh, she was saying that. Yeah, she was uh, friends, at least with uh, Miles Davis, and uh, supposedly was the person who got uh, Miles Davis interested in Ferraris. She, um, I. Uh, I called her up once and I said, she had a reference to um, uh, Dave Brubeck's uh, Take 5. And, um, and I called her and I said, well, I, th I think that Paul Desmond, the, the alto sax player, is credited with, with uh, composing Take 5. And I'm telling this to the person who once told me that the Brubeck Quartet used to practice in her kitchen. <laughs> 
<laughs> so she corrected you on that then, did she? Or? Well, it turns out Paul Desmond did. Okay, <laughs> good for you that take time. Five, but good for you. I, I, I just changed it to say the, the Dave Brubeck Quartet's take five. Mm -hmm. Right. But we should also point out when she, we say that she raced in the 50s and 60s, I mean, she was good buddies with, uh, you know, the, the grand pilots of the day, you know, uh, Sterling Moss, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, who else did I see her with? Uh, one of the Ricardo brothers, uh, you know. She's credited for naming the uh, Maserati as a Tipo 59, the birdcage. She gave the right? nickname oh. the birdcage. That's what I've always heard. You know, the, with someone like wow. Denise, you hear all these stories and you know, how apocryphal are some of them. Mm -hmm. but, right. but then when she confirms something like the Mercedes C-AMG story, you're like, well, mm -hmm. it's probably all true. <laughs> she was also a great photographer and took a lot of photographs. Ben, I don't know, did, did you get a picture of that Ferrari carry? Yeah, so, oh, yeah. so this is a 1950s vintage Grand Prix race car carrier that would go around to the different tracks, and you can see they've got three of the race cars on it. And she took a picture of this. I think it's from 1959, or what does 58. it say? 58. And uh, when I was uh, at her house, uh, she had all these photos lying around, and I picked that up, and I went, that is so cool. Well, she gave it to me, and I, 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 I said, Denise, you got to let me pay you for this. And she would not hear anything of it. So that's on our office wall. As you guys walk out here today, you, you know, you, you'll see that up on the wall. She was quite the photographer. Even if know. she'd done a third of what she actually did, it was mm -hmm. amazing. I mean, right. she was a living legend. It was terrific that we had her around, that she was around yeah. as long as she was. I mean, she, and right up until the last couple of years, she was still out and about at, at different press events and, and very active and it's, it's a hell of a life. It's a great one to have had. Yeah. No, like you say, you know, if you could have only could lived have, that yeah. life, right. And, and to your point, I mean, yeah, yeah, she passed away at 88, but like you said, still going yeah. to press events into her 80s. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, you know, boy, if I can do that. Exactly. <laughs> that'd yeah. be awesome. I don't want to stop. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, we're going to miss Denise yes. tremendously, as anybody listening can tell. Yeah. So let's move on to another topic. Well, okay, we got to go to the autonomous truck. Gary, you were All right, there. So, so here's the thing that it occurs to me. Okay, so we never talk about trucks unless they're F-150s or Rams or Silverados, right? And, and there's this whole other world that exists of things like, like Freightliner trucks and Mack trucks and Volvo trucks and on and on and on. So I get this invitation to, to go to Las Vegas for some mysterious big event that Freightliner is holding, and they're, they're keeping this all on the QT. And they invite 156 journalists from around the world. Now, say that again, around the world. Around the world. There, were, there was a guy from Turkey there. There were guys from Australia there, Brazil, Mexico, you name it, okay? All around the world. And so this is an important event for Daimler. Very important event for Daimler. And um, so... What it turned out to be was that they have developed a level three autonomous truck that got a license plate from the governor of Nevada, Brian Sandoval, to, to be able to be on public roads. So we're talking about a class eight truck. The biggest up there. The, 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 biggest. the big truck. And and this thing can go. That Ben's has, got it up on the screen now. And um, so... Yesterday afternoon, I'm sitting in the passenger seat of that truck while there's a German engineer behind the wheel turned and talking to me with his hands off the wheel, his feet off the pedals, and we're on a two-lane road with curves. And I say to him at one point, um, doesn't it make you nervous when, oh, you see that large semi with a tractor trailer coming at us from the other direction? He goes, nah, not a problem at all. <laughs> and... So, so it's very interesting that, so, you know, they are absolutely convinced. They're, you know, the, um, um, the um, Martin Dom, who is the head of Daimler Trucks North America, made the point that they had just built a new headquarters in Portland, Oregon, mm -hmm. which, you know, really says trucks when you think <laughs> Portland, Oregon, you think trucks. Um, Isn't Packar there? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We'll get into that in a minute. But, but I mean, so, so but the point is, is he said, okay, it, you know, two years to build this building, 30,000 trucks came to our one building in order to do this. So, I mean, the amount of, of truck 
folks that, that are out there, I think that we, we just don't even pay attention to them. So, you know, they've done these, these studies on, on long haul truckers, and they're basically um, coming to the realization that, you know, when these guys are driving for a long time, you know, they can get tired, they can get sleepy. And so they're, they're basically saying that the majority of accidents that occur during these events is operator error. So what they want to basically do is, is have it such that your Class 8 truck will be more along the lines of a, um, a passenger airplane, right? Well, and, uh, and I don't know what the hours, the, the, the uh, limitations are, but there has been a long um, uh, struggle between uh, government and uh, the, the U.S., uh, I guess it would be DOT, um, and, and the trucking industry, the lobby group, between how many hours can a driver go before a break or before sleep. Mm -hmm. And um, obviously this uh, could help answer that question, at least re reduce um, the sleepiness, sleepiness the, right. uh, the, how tired the driver is. Certainly, I mean, and, and when we talk about autonomous vehicles and getting onto the roadways, this is definitely a, an interesting way to get it into the system where, where regular drivers see it operate, where it's a little tangential to their lives. And once we see some success there, it gets a little bit easier to accept, even on a passenger car level. So, and, and to the point of the drivers, it, it's, it makes terrific sense when you're talking about long stretches of right. Nevada and, and Nebraska to be able to, to free up some of the driver's um, mental sp space and let him relax a little bit. It's driving these kinds of trucks not only for lots of hours, they take a, a higher level of concentration. They're bigger and they're hauling more and you've got to be careful about people who tend to not understand how close they should or should not be to them. And all of those, it, it seems like a really nice way to introduce autonomy to the, to the actual roadways. Uh, you know, Gary, Gary, what kind of transmission did the truck have? Well, it's interesting. I was just going to mention that that you know we we sort of take for granted that you know there's that you know the, the truckers are you know going through. Yeah. And it's got a twelve speed transmission, not a twelve speed transmission, but yeah. it's an automatic transmission. Yeah. Right. Okay. Right. And, and and this is the thing that is is very astonishing to me. Now, now, Freightliner um, has forty percent of the market for for heavy duty trucks in the United in States the US. in the U.S. and um, these guys have, um, and another interesting thing that I didn't know is that, you know, those of us who grew up around here, as, as you did and, and, and as I did, Detroit Diesel, we're very familiar with, with Detroit Diesel. Well, now they're using the name Detroit as signifying their technology packages, mm -hmm. okay? So it's just, it's just Detroit. It's not Detroit Diesel anymore, it's Detroit. And if you've driven by that uh, facility on Telegraph and Plymouth Road, I mean, yeah. they've, you know, Daimler spent a ton of money there. But, so, they're doing all sorts of things in terms of how to save fuel. So, for example, you know, they're, they have a coast mode, okay? So as you're driving along, that the engine will, you know, stop taking in fuel. Now, it's not, it's not a start-stop system, okay? It's, right. it's still, just it's cut still, the fuel off. Cut the fuel off, and uh, they're doing e-coast, that they're, you know, doing regenerative braking to a degree, and, and, you know, it's just, it's just remarkable what these guys are doing in terms of this, you know, and, and this, is, this is separate from, from this truck. whole autonomy right. thing. Right. And, you know, in terms of the autonomy thing, um, what they're doing is, is that they're using GPS information, okay? So, the guy's driving along the two-lane road. Now, it's, it's very important for them to see side markers on the road, okay? Mm -hmm. And so they're saying mm -hmm. that's pretty essential because if, if you look at a Mercedes S-Class, there's, there's more sensors and, and you know, long-term or long-range radar, short-range radar, radar, LIDAR cameras and so on. And this is basically radar and camera system. And, um, but as you're going along, then... A, a, um, on the screen, it'll come up and it'll say highway pilot available. So the driver can then just push a button on the steering wheel and then just take his hands off the steering wheel and the thing begins to drive. Now, while we were driving, he had programmed into the navigation system where he was going to be getting onto the freeway. Well, um, the truck then alerts him to say, hey, take over the truck because you are now going to be you know, making a turn and getting on to the freeway. Now, you know, we asked him, okay, so let's just say we were just driving down this road and this road had a turn like that. Could the truck do it? Absolutely. It, it could do it itself. Well, you, you said a key yeah. thing, and just so the audience understands, there's five levels mm -hmm. of autonomy. Right. 
So there's level zero, and that's the key. It starts with zero, it doesn't end with five. It starts with zero, and that's nothing. That, there's nothing on the car. That's anybody's car out yeah. there zero right now, <laughs> pretty much. Level one is then cruise control. Mm -hmm. Just cruise control, you set the cruise and that's the speed. Level three is adaptive cruise control and increasingly traffic jam assist, mm -hmm. where it can speed up and slow down and do turns, curves, on, all on the freeway. And then level four is fully autonomous, where you get it right. and say, you know, take me to the office or take me home, and the car does everything and you don't get involved at all. So this is a level three truck. Right, and, and, and Wolfgang Bernhardt, who runs Daimler trucks and buses worldwide, um, who is basically, um, for, for those people in Detroit may recall when Dr. Z, Zecha was running the place yeah. as Batman. He was his Robin. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that that he they, they they stressed they have no interest in going to level four. They they don't see level four as as being doable oh, at all. And and, they, and they, mm -hmm. that's 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 off the game. Well, you got to think about it though. I mean, um, you know, it's one thing for a car which weighs two tons. It's another thing for a semi truck which weighs forty four tons. Right. I mean, in, in because it was, it was funny. So so they have an active brake assist system and they were doing a demonstration of that yesterday and you know in in one of those situations where there's a, a barrier and, and the car will or truck will automatically break yeah. and the, the truck was going 20 miles an hour and well it sort of hit that thing you know what i mean but and, and you know and how often have we done that like yeah. we were up north doing that remember yeah. in, the, in the conti thing you know and i'm just thinking wow cars are so much more advanced at that but then you just think of the mass right i think mean that you're trying to if they go to level four, too, then they're putting, theoretically, putting the people that they're selling the truck to out of work, right? I mean, if it's level four and right. you don't putting need a driver, out of work. Yeah. Yeah, that, out of work. that's not sure. necessarily a place you, you want to talk about going. It, It'll happen um, to cab drivers space. first. It, it may not, but we're going to take a break here in just a minute. If that very issue, truck driver, is one of the reasons that's driving all this technology, and we'll come back to that in a sec. So coming back to that thought, uh, what's the number one complaint in the trucking industry? They cannot get drivers. Number one issue, big problem in the trucking industry right now. Mm -hmm. So that's another reason why this mm -hmm. is coming in. Uh, maybe Daimler's saying, oh, we don't want to have anything to do with level four. Let's see what they say in a decade. Well, you know, and, and Stephanie, you were mentioning earlier about how, how Mercedes had done a similar Thing. What was it last year? In October, I think I want to say it was September, October, right before the um, big commercial truck show in Germany. Mm -hmm. Mercedes had done uh, uh, another yeah, one they, of their other class eights, and I I don't remember all the details. So how different it was the Actros, was, the the Mercedes Actros, Actros. truck? And uh, but but the interesting thing, the difference was was that they they took a piece of the autobahn and blocked it off, and then they had to truck drive on it, and so you know very very. Um, contained conditions. And, and it's interesting that um, Bernhardt was saying that at the time of that drive, I think it happened actually in July, okay. And, okay. and that he basically said, okay, we're going to develop this stuff and wherever in the world will allow us to put it on the, on the roads, we're going there. And the state of Nevada stepped up and they basically worked with Daimler and wrote regulations in this period, you know, this comparatively contained period of time that allows them to do that. And so, you know, because the question was, well, you know, why are you doing this in Nevada? And, and they, they said, we'd have done it anywhere. And um, I was talking to uh, a guy who works for, for uh, the trucks, because I know that, you know, on, on the show you've talked about, you know, the whole issue of liability and, and you know, how that's all going to be worked out. And so apparently part of the thinking is, is, that, is that they see going forward that if you go get a vehicle, an autonomous vehicle or a vehicle that has autonomous technology, that basically you will sign a thing that is a certificate of safety, which indicates that you who have purchased this vehicle fully understand that it has these capabilities at which, and by doing so, you begin to assume the liability rather than the vehicle manufacturer taking the liability. And so when I asked him, I said, well, you know, you, you got to believe that, you know, th you know, the first thing that's going to happen is, is that it's going to be some unfortunate accident of a, you know, a lady with a baby carriage and it's going to be, you know, conflagration and it's going to take out a city block and, and, and he goes, well, but if we can prove that the technology did what the technology is supposed to do. Yeah. yeah. 
Right. No, that's right, as, as long as it does. But I, I keep saying, of course there will be failures, technological failures with this. It, it will happen. We're, we human beings do not create perfect right. machines. And when I talked to Chris Ermson from Google about this, he said the same thing. And he said that our legal system is robust. It'll figure out who is responsible. But he works for Google, not for an auto manufacturer. He's not used to the, the kinds of recalls and lawsuits and so on that, that the I, auto industry has had for I, I hear this and I, I, decades and decades. I'm sick and tired of the auto industry wringing its hands over who's going to get sued, who is liable. They get sued all the time. Right. They have armies of lawyers. They pay big bucks for outside counsel. Mm -hmm. And what do they do? They budget for it every year. Yeah. So get ready, guys. You're going to be liable if your autonomous car crashes and there was something wrong with the system. Start budgeting. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and the bottom line is, I almost hate to admit this because I like the idea of still being able to drive and I'm not sure where we're going to be in 20 or 30 years, but uh, you know, if you have another sort of defect on the, defe defect on the car um, that might cause kind of crashes that you've had with the Chevy Cobalts or the, you certainly wouldn't have, one would presume, Toyota ex unintended acceleration because those events have proven to be uh, people my age and older hitting the wrong pedal, uh, not not the actual car. So I, I think in the in the long run, overall, you're going to have a much reduction of, of uh, right, much safer cars. Yeah, you, you know, they're saying the operator error that's causing all of these accidents for, for truck drivers, and therefore, yeah, right. if you can reduce the amount of operator error, then... When, when we first started talking about autonomous cars a few years ago and the, the opportunities and what could happen, you know, a lot of times the, this whole zero accident idea was put out there. And it, that's not the realistic one. But if you still, even if you, you know, reduce accidents by 60, 70, 80 percent and reduce severity of accidents so the people aren't hurt as badly and there's less property damage, you're still saving a ton of money that way over time. Right. Um, it's... It, it's, it's a good system. Something will go wrong. Yeah, I do think yeah. that our legal system but, will, will but sort point, it through. And, you know, uh, what it's the still, safety... It's still better off. The safety adv our, uh, experts will tell you, over 90% of all accidents are human error. Yeah. So this technology has the opportunity to get rid of all that human error. Yeah. All of it. Yeah. So it still means, you know, 7 8% of the accidents will be caused by some problem with the vehicle or some problem with the infrastructure. But, you know... The stats are horrific. Globally, 1.3 million people killed every single year. Right. 30 to 50 million injured badly enough to go to the hospital at a cost of $100 billion a year. And you have to add that, that roughly half that, or at least in the United States, roughly half the number, which I think is 33,000 per year uh, Fatality. fatalities. Uh, are the pedestrians hit by cars. Right. In terms no, 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 it's, no. It's not nearly that. It's about 5,000. 5,000. 5,000 okay. are pedestrians. Okay. Right. Well, and so, I mean, the, the, the big, the next big kind of frontier for automotive, uh, for passenger car autonomy is what do we do in, in city areas? And, and obviously everybody's worked on that. We've, we've all been, been at uh, uh, programs, companies like Continental and Honda and so on and Nissan, mm -hmm. who um, will show you what their autonomous car can do so far. In a what's supposed to be an urban setting, with, which is just with one dummy being walked across the street on a, on a machine, but and, we had the and, dummy in the studio here. Uh, yeah, from you talking about me again, Gary? <laughs> <laughs> obviously, they're they're working on all that, and and obviously we're we're just near the edge of being able to buy a car where it will drive you many miles down I eighty or you know I ninety five or I ninety four, whatever without having your hand on the wheel and your feet on the pedals. And, um, and that's coming very soon. So the stuff that, well, you know, getting that down, getting that to work in the city and city applications um, 10 years away, that doesn't seem so far-fetched. Well, and the interesting thing too is, is if you look at younger generations, what do they really accept in terms of failure rate and, and what do they accept versus other products that they have that they're kind of used to pushing it and restarting it. Granted, cars are much more complicated and the, and the results can be much more disastrous, but we don't, uh, older generations don't like the idea that you just, if it breaks, you just 
repower it and it comes back on. And we have a, we seem to have much less patience for product failure of any type. If you've got generations coming in that are much more comfortable with technology, with what it, what it can and cannot do, and understand where it can fail and how it can fail, there may be on that side a little, there may be less hand-wringing about liability than we think. Well, It'll the, be interesting to see how that shakes down, because if we're talking 10, 15 years out, we're talking that, that it's, it's going to be more millennials expect, experimenting with all of this. And, and what is their expectation for what a vehicle can and cannot do? And if they're making that choice and looking at it before they've had kid kids, too, and when they haven't already have been used to having that control, it, their, their mindset might be much more forgiving than we expect. But don't forget the Google car initially was thought of as for old people who didn't drive. And so that this, is, would have, yeah. this would come and get them. But I mean, you got three things. You've got technology. And to your point, Todd, I think the technology is, is going forward because there's so many companies working on this yeah. stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And so that'll, that'll be you know, achievable pretty soon. Yeah. Then you've got what you were talking about, that you've got the market, you've got the you know, consumer demand for this stuff. And you know, that remains to be seen. And, remains and, to be seen. Um, but then there's the, the third part, and I think this is, this is the more challenging part, and they made the point. Okay, so there is a license plate that is going to be on this, this Freightliner Inspiration vehicle, okay? This is a license plate for the state of Nevada, right. okay? It's not a license plate for the state of Arizona and, and so on. And so the problem is, is that they have to, you know, they're looking for federal regulations that will allow this so you'll actually be able to have interstate commerce as it were with one of these things right. because right now that doesn't exist right. but they think that they're going to have to do it state by state by state yeah well, we may. Uh, nobody wants to see that happen in the industry no. to the very point that you're making we don't want 50 different regulations this is why NHTSA has already got a deep study program on it. NHTSA wants to be the one that writes the rules, and the industry wants NHTSA to write the rules. They don't want politicians doing it, and they don't want 50 individual states yeah. doing it. Right. No, that's hey, we've got some questions coming in all about right. this discussion. JJ says, isn't Daimler in Oregon because they bought Freightliner? And he says, Dieter Zetcha worked there. Did Dieter work at Freightliner? That, JJ might be right. He may have I spent some he time I, there. I, yeah. He might be right. And it's true, uh, Oregon uh, is where Freightliner was, and Daimler bought it, and the name was already established. In most of the world, Mercedes-Benz sells trucks as Mercedes-Benz. They don't sell them as Daimler. They don't sell them as Freightliner. It's only in North America, I believe, that you can buy a Freightliner truck. Um, Architect wants to know, are there any American-owned independent Class 8 builders anymore? And I believe there is one, and that's Packard, which nobody knows that name, but they do know the brand names that they make trucks under, which is Freight or uh, Kenworth. Pe Kenworth, Kenworth and, Peterbilt. and Peterbilt. And they're based in Oregon. Yeah. And I think that's how Freightliner was there. Somehow or other, that Oregon, which is not known as a central part of manufacturing, much right. less the automotive industry, is the home to some of the biggest truck yes. And the I wonder how they're doing just because I don't see as many uh, uh, freight, uh, and as now I'm doing it, Kenworth's or Peterbilt's on the road is, say, 20 or 30 or 40. No, you're ago. absolutely right. Yeah. Uh, you know, Freightliner, Freightliner and Volvo and Mac, mm -hmm. and Mac is owned by Renault, by the way. Oh, uh, I didn't Dom, know yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why, this guy, that's why architects are asking, are there any American ones left? Yeah. I thought Mac was yeah. owned by Volvo. I think uh, Max uh, Renault. I left my iPad in the other room. At one point it was. Okay, okay chat room. <laughs> Who owns Mac? Get us that answer. Let's see. Uh, Let's see if I can do that. What else? Uh, I'll get to this one in a, ma a minute. Uh, JHW Nissan, I hope I got that right, says part of the problem with autonomous semi trucks is cost. Something like this requires a huge investment. Who other than Walmart? Can afford something like this, you know. But, but okay, but, but Walmart I mean, look, yeah, I mean, trucks. It, it, <laughs> yeah, I mean, if Walmart can do it, I mean, it's yeah, that's and it, and it's all it all comes down to the age old answer of mass production. Is that you know, uh, twenty five years ago, who would who would have thought we'd all have CD players in our cars? Now we don't have them in our cars anymore. Yeah, I mean, it's old tech. You know, it's old tech, and and uh, for that matter, on a passenger car now, you've got uh, some of the some of the building blocks of autonomy uh, trickling down from the luxury and premium brands into the mainstream brands, the, uh, the, lane, uh, the, uh, the lane departure control and the, uh, the blind spot uh, indicators, cameras. Cameras are now so cheap you can put them all over the damn car. Right. 
the scale is much different in the in the medium heavy commercial vehicle segment as well. I mean, you're talking about something that's not 300,000 units in the United States. I want to say it was about 250 last year or this year. Um, so we aren't talking about needing the kind of scale in order to make it workable that you need for a passenger car. This, these vehicles sell for a whole lot more to begin with. And to Todd's point, the technology that would enable it is, is costs are coming down. This isn't going on sale tomorrow. Right. Let's no, also no, remember and they that, made, too. They made the point that the technology that they're using is the technology that is being used in the S-Class. Okay, so, so it's... So it's it's cost amortization is there. I mean, they're 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 getting this stuff, and as as you know, you point out. I mean, the price of cameras is just going way down, and I mean, and and uh, and lidar and radar, and you know, and and if you look at uh, Daimler's bottom line, it's uh, it's recent uh, profit statement. Uh, they're making lots of money both because of luxury cars and because of trucks, mm -hmm. because that's yeah. what they do. Mm -hmm. Like. You know, it's not well known, but there are already are autonomous vehicles for sale and have been in the field in use for two years right now. And the two manufacturers are uh, Caterpillar and Komatsu. Mm. And they make these gigantic mining trucks. Yeah. And in Australia, Rio Tinto, which is this big iron ore mining company, has been using uh, Caterpillar autonomous mining trucks for almost two years right now. And I think it's in the, the, the oil tar fields in Canada. They're using Komatsu trucks. And fully autonomous, no driver. These are level four autonomy. Mm -hmm. But they, they go on a, the same route every day. There's no traffic. There's no pedestrians. There's no none of that stuff. Um, the cost per truck is about $100,000 but because they don't have to have drivers taking bathroom breaks or lunch breaks and they can run 24 seven. In fact, they even can say, okay, I've run so many miles, I'm taking myself right to the garage for an oil change right mm -hmm. now. Uh, the, the, the numbers work out real well. So in uh, the Alberta oil tar sand fields, they, each truck hauls a million dollars worth of tar sand every day, a million dollars every day. They figure with this uh, autonomous technology, they're getting a minimum of a 10% improvement. So 10% of a million dollars, they're saving $100,000 hmm. every single day. They pay for the technology in no time. Yeah. When you think about factories, there's been automated guided vehicles rolling thinking. around in those <laughs> things for, you know, I mean, if you, if, you have a, if you have a deterministic route and you know where it is and, you know, you choose not to be standing there when this giant Komatsu thing is coming at you, then you're probably all right. <laughs> it is Volvo, by the way, Jen. <laughs> oh, it is Volvo? Oh, yeah. Okay, I thought... It's crafty Swedes. Yeah, right. <laughs> and uh, we gotta and be clear. from we Volvo be... cars. That's yeah. right, we gotta yes, be clear that Volvo trucks Volvo is separate from... Were, oh, yeah. Those were separated were totally, totally separate ago, companies, right. 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 Uh, let's see, uh, F-S-T-N-C-L-N, fast Lincoln it almost looks like, but says, trucks look great, but I don't know how any computer software could predict and or react well enough to what havoc some humans can cause. So uh, you'd be surprised at how fast yeah. this technology can react. Yeah. It, it's well, to the other thing, think about the last part of that statement, the havoc that humans can cause. Okay, so <laughs> <laughs> how do you solve that by getting humans out of the equation? Uh, which and is kind of scary in itself. And it's but limited. Use. I mean, it's it's limited conditions. And again, it's not in the middle yeah. of downtown where you've got uh, much more activity to predict. And where in a downtown situation, you may be choosing between the lesser of two evils. Which that's another thing about level four autonomy that that gets a little bit uncomfortable is letting a computer decide. Well, do I do I hit the car? Do I hit the person or whatever? I mean, obviously, most of us would say put right, but um, it, it does open up a gray area. And and how do you have the computer do that that you're comfortable with? And that's not where this truck is going. This truck is no. just right. sort of in limited situations, being able to relieve the driver from constant constant activity and, and constantly having to pay attention. But have you ever seen any of these uh, computer simulations of what an autonomous car can see? Because remember, it's got video sure. cameras, yeah. it's yeah. got laser, it, LIDAR, it's got sonar, it's got radar. Its electronic visibility it's is cute. far greater than any human's. 
far, far greater. Exactly. And when you get and the connected night. car where they're talking to each other, doesn't matter if somebody's running a red light, pulling out of a blind alley, pulling out of park traffic. Right. Your car sees it way before right. you do. Right. I, I, rode in, I, I rode in one of the Google cars, not the, the new prototypes, but uh, one of the Lexi and in, um, uh, in Mountain View, California. And it was very heavy on the brakes when some, something or somebody pulled in its way, uh, hit the brakes a bit too hard. Mm -hmm. We still need to work on that. But they've been doing that for many, many years now, and I forgot how many miles. I think they say they've logged something like 400,000 miles. Oh, that's and, an old number. I think they're closer uh, to a million. Yeah it, might yeah. yeah, it might be that. And um, another Chris Ermson story, he, he leads the Google driverless car uh, project, and he said a few years ago they came across uh, a woman in a power wheelchair chasing a duck with a broom, <laughs> doing, figure eights, <laughs> doing figure eights in the road. And his answer was, we can program for that. We can program, we can, we, we can put in a, the algorithm to, to account for all of this stuff. The so problem is when she's planning on it, that, like it or then, not. And then, the, and then the kid runs out, you know, well, behind her. That, you get more. Thing. Yeah, of course. Still... Well, of course, and that's why when we, when we see these urban tests of, of autonomous cars and you have the, the one dummy on the, on the machine crossing the street, well, what about New York or Boston right. or Chicago or where, San Francisco, where there's a lot of people crossing and not all in the crosswalk, and bicyclists and, uh, and motorcyclists and people walking dogs and so on and so forth. That's a lot more Reason. complex. See, but maybe at that point, the car just basically says, you got to drive. Yes, exactly. Perhaps, but the idea is that, I mean, the, the, the Google prototype car does not have a steering wheel. It does not have right. pedals. Right. The idea is that that car will take you, probably as an Uber car, because Google's an investor in Uber, will take you through those downtown areas where you, where you want to or need to go. So my understanding was is that their, their, their initial plan, though, is, is to do this in, in effect, gated communities or to begin with, right. to a controlled other environment. Controlled yeah, environment. Sure, that's exactly right. Oh well, yeah, yeah, you and, want to start so, there. college campus, R and D campus, and, medical and once campus, you, and once you get community. that taken right. care of, then you begin to answer these things. Right. And, uh, right. So the best thing I heard uh, Ermson say is they're now teaching the car to be more aggressive. That when it comes to a four-way stop, oh, right. he said if. If you program the car to wait till everybody clears, he says, they'll just stomp on you all day long. Never, so the new differentiation between automakers could be their, that programming. Yeah, and could, how that feels. could well be. Hey, we're going to take another break, and then we'll get on to other topics. More to talk about. We'll be back in a moment. Hey, we really welcome Jeep Renegade as a sponsor of the show. Awesome to get that. And just a hint at other car companies, <laughs> we're always open for more sponsors. Yeah, we had that Renegade the in, the, in the studio. Remember that? We, had, we did. And uh, yeah. Art Anderson, the uh, chief engineer of that vehicle, was That's right. sat in this chair. He did. Wow. We had Klaus talking all about <laughs> the interior of it last week. Too. So, um, yeah, plenty of other things to talk about. Uh, Todd, I know one of the things you wanted to get into was this report on the BMW i5. Now, the BMW i5 is, uh, and I have to look at my notes, George Cocker, our European correspondent, uh, wrote about it uh, at automobilemag.com. It's uh, on the site right now. And he says that... Um, the new uh, chief at BMW, Harold Kruger, and uh, the, the R&D chief, Klaus Freilich, have killed a lot of uh, Norbert Reithofer's projects, but one that they've, they're keeping is, is the uh, i5, which is basically a, kind of in between an i3, which, of course, is a small electric car that you can also get a, with range, mm -hmm. extender in, range extender engine, and the i8, which is the sports car that automatically comes with a range extender engine, this i5 will be available both ways and it's a it's a, a sedan that's larger has more interior space than an i3 it has um, a long wheelbase and short overhangs 
And so the obvious uh, target with that car would be Tesla. Mm -hmm. Now, two weeks ago, Te Sandy Monroe here said that the i5 was going to be a fuel cell car. There's been talk about that as well. But uh, I believe, at least according to George Cocker, um, they're, they're working on uh, a pure electric and also a range extended electric uh, version of that. I could see where a car like that would be. You could do a number of different things with it, obviously. Um, if you design the the basic oh, right. platform, yeah, you know. picture of it up there. Mm. There you go. So, so isn't it looks like a four door i eight? Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. It's interesting that that you know, Todd, you mentioned that you know it's it's targeting Tesla. I mean, who would have imagined five years ago that exactly. it would be this this company? And and you looked at the numbers of uh, they they reported their earnings for the first quarter. Uh, yeah. On, yeah. Uh, on uh, auto we had daily it on, today. On daily today, right? Right. That, that uh, car, by the way, is uh, that. That rendering is exactly that. That's our conception of what the car might look gotcha. like. So, you know, we don't have any spy shots yet. I don't think anybody's seen the car. Um, I don't think any have been out on the road being tested. But it sure would make sense to, you know, do, do a four-door version. Yeah. yeah, that makes, right. you know. Hey, I, I just got to jump back to, uh, we, we got a great audience here. Sam Fiorani, who's with uh, Auto Forecast Solutions, just tweeted in. He says, other independent Class 8 truck makers include Navistar, Navistar. under the international, the international brand, yep. and Oshkosh. So, but Oshkosh, I believe, is uh, making mainly military. Mostly military I don't think any of their stuff yeah. is commercial. Mm -hmm. He says Freightliner is based in Portland because it was Consolidated Freightways who founded the company that oh, was based there. Yeah. So thank you for that, Sam. Really appreciate it. Our work wrote in to say, recent law has given pedestrians right of the way, which has led to confusing situations. Theoretically, autonomous cars could be stopped every few feet. And that might be true too. Well, pedestrians have always had the right of yeah. the way in most. Well, yeah. And then, arguably, arguably, cars that are being driven by humans would be stopped every few feet if every <laughs> so few this feet. So, this will stop people from running down pedestrians, perhaps. See, see, I, I, see I, I was trying to talk to these guys about saying that they ought to put Asimov's three laws of robotics into yeah. the, yeah. you know, well, to, to make the determination of what they do and what they don't do. Sounds like yeah. an editorial, Gary. So, it's. Uh, <laughs> uh, let's see, JJ said, are you going to cover the Tesla coming to Michigan news? I heard something on the radio this morning. What the hell was it? Uh, Tesla bought, there, there's a, a company that has been oh, building oh, oh, the a tooling company. company, and they bought the tooling company. Yeah, was it Riviera Tool? Riviera Tooling. and the, Magna bought it. I'm sorry? Magna bought it. Tesla bought it. No, Magna or bought Tesla. it. So, so the tool, Riviera supplies the Fremont plant, right? and Magna bought the company, and they're changing the name to Tesla Tesla tool and die. But owned by Magna? It's owned by Magna. Yesterday there was a story that Tesla had, had agreed to buy it. Yeah. But that wasn't a story from Tesla. So it may not be. Yeah, it was Magna. Um, got a release so, from Magna today that said that. that Magna bought it. That so is this such a small area. company that all they do is tooling for Tesla or do they also serve? Only 100 they, I think they do other. Uh -huh. so, That's yeah, very yeah. interesting though, you know, because... Uh, the, the guys in town here have largely outsourced all their tool and die making. I'm talking GM, Ford, and Chrysler. Mm -hmm. So to see Tesla go out and buy a tooling company, I find fascinating. Mag or, Magna. Or Magna, excuse me, Gary. Yeah, no, 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 no. No, so that, it's just, I mean. It's, I mean, what a, it's I mean, not that interesting when it's Magna, right? <laughs> no, no, I think, I think it's, in some ways it's sort of more interesting because, you know, I mean, because if, if you think about tooling companies, they're, you know, they're like, Bob's tooling company, or right. you know, I mean, it's just. But and, Magna started as a tooling company, mm -hmm. and, but, but nobody, nobody names it after their customer, right? Right. Yeah. So that, you, you, that don't, you don't have that, and right. so it could be a new trend. Okay. Before we get on to other topics here, Mitch Weaver wants to know: Did Todd Loss a pre-order a new red Miata this week? <laughs> <laughs> no, because I wouldn't. That's not the Miata I would pick, uh, and um, I wouldn't go. With, I've I've had red cars, but. Uh, I've kind of moved beyond that. Um, I, I'm the, the what I'm interested in would be the the club sport, and I'd probably take a different color mm -hmm. myself. What color? Well, my wife would want uh, uh, misty blue mica, <laughs> which oh, is right. but good. we have an R08. Um, I've got the stormy blue. Yeah. Oh, stormy blue. I keep stormy calling blue, it misty blue. It's stormy blue mica. That's what we've got as well. Yes, we have two the of black those. interior. Like so. I've got a 12 and you've got an 8. Uh, an 08, yeah. 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 So cool. that would be one choice. Uh, uh, BRG type color, color would yeah. be good too. Yeah. I would yeah. like that. 
So, Gary, one of the topics you wanted to get into is muscle cars. Yeah, so we, we've spent all this time talking about, you know, autonomous vehicles and autonomous trucks, and it, it seems like no, nobody's having fun driving cars anymore. <laughs> well, and, you know, and I, so I, I was looking, you know, I was thinking, okay, I mean, I think this could conceivably be, you know, a, a golden age for the muscle car. I mean, and again, you know, you mentioned we had Klaus here last week, and he had his Hellcat t-shirt on, right? And you were lusting over his Hellcat t-shirt. I know, and I'm not a t-shirt guy. And, and we were like talking, you know, and we were talking about the, you know, the 707 horsepower, you know, mill that they have that they stick in those cars. And so I, I looked at the numbers to see how muscle cars are doing. And so, you know, I compared April cumulative 2015 to April of last year. So you look at the Charger. So, so far this year, they sold 35,281 cars. And um, that's compared to 33,046 last year. So 7% increase. Okay. It's pretty good, right? Better it's, than the it, market? It's better than the market. Stephanie knows these numbers backward and forward. Challenger, um, this is interesting. So this, so far this year, 22,728. Last year, 16,156, which means they're up 41%. Yowza. And that now, car's been, that has a facelift. It has a facelift, so. Plus the halo of the 707 horsepower. Right. And, and, as, and, as yeah. with the charger. And, and then, they would have been winding down a bit last year. Then this is, this is, a, this is a, quite a number. Mustang. 42,995 versus 26,839, or a 60% increase. Man. Okay. You've got, got some the numbers changeover up there, going right? on. The, the, yeah, you've got They're changeover. The, the, the increase is, is bloated because the, the, the old Mustang was being ramped down at that yeah. point, mm -hmm. and their numbers were pretty low. But you make a good point. They're doing very well with the new Mustang. Mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, anytime you do a new car in that segment, because that segment is so style conscious, if you will. Yep. And, and Ford learned kind of the hard way uh, since the 05 Mustang that you need to do very regular updates and uh, special packages mm -hmm. and, um, and kind of, you know, kind of follow the Mini Cooper. And they just um, announced a new, new package, right? The um, Ford for the Mustang? GT 350R, yeah. yeah. Well, I was going to say, we were just talking about saying you, that you didn't think people were having fun driving. I think they are. One of the interesting things is autonomous cars may prove to be something that you want your neighbor to have. Right. You want like, your neighbor I, to have? Yeah, yeah I, I want to be safe with, with everybody else being, being really safe, but I still want to have fun. Oh, so you want to drive like so, a maniac, so the... No. Autonomous car. I want to be a maniac, but uh, but no. I mean, we see that a little bit with with some hybrids and some EVs. That it's really great for somebody else to buy into this technology that keeps us safe and that keeps efficiency. But I still want to do what it was that I wanted mm -hmm. to do to begin with. We might see a little bit of that happening no. with autonomous. All right, we, got, well, we, got to, we have to come back to that GT. But we, we, got to, we, have, to have, we have to have the last one because we can't leave the Camaro out. Right. I mean, because that would be right. not nice of us. Okay, so Camaro so far twenty four thousand two hundred and twenty nine versus 28,611, which is down 15.3%. And, and again, there's a new one coming Camaro. out. There's a new one coming out, but I, I thought this, so I thought, let's be fair to Camaro here and look how it's doing compared to some other General Motors cars. No Buick model has sold 24,000 vehicles, so none. No Cadillac has sold 24,000 vehicles, including the vaunted Escalade. Okay, we always say, oh, the Escalade, it's on fire, right? So yes, the Escalade, had a 118.4% increase so far this year compared to last year. 118.4%. How many did it sell? 6,771, okay, versus the Camaro 24,229. So, so even in a so, ramp down period, it's still, ain't bad. it's still strong. Not bad at all. So, yeah. so what accounts for this? Gas? No, I don't think so. Uh, I think, you know, when the, when the pony cars, as we called them back then, first came out and, you know, I'm... A couple of us have remember when that first Mustang came out. You know, some of us can't remember because that of, was uh, well. I, <laughs> I, I certainly can't age. remember. But uh, the the first baby boomers were turning eighteen at that point, and um, and now a lot of the same baby boomers are buying those cars. But I think also people in their maybe late thirties to forties to fifties, people who. Uh, are tired of the fact that their other car has to be uh, a CUV or a minivan, or maybe uh, if they don't need a high capacity vehicle, people have had maybe three or four Civics in a row or three or four Toyota Camrys in a row, 
you just want something a little bit d different, a little bit special. You get into one of these cars and you find out that actually nowadays the, the quality and the reliability of that uh, Ford Mustang or Chevy Camaro or, or Dodge Challenger is not far off of what the Toyota or the Honda would be. Well, and, and we're also in a little bit more optimistic economic space. Um, you know, in the recession, you might not buy a sports car just because you feel like you can't quite have that much fun. Uh, we're in a better space than we are. So, and that's coinciding with, with low gas prices. That makes, they give, what low gas prices are really doing is giving a consumer a little bit more money to play with right now. Mm -hmm. And they're doing it in a couple of different ways. Sometimes consumers are going to a larger vehicle. Sometimes they're putting more content in vehicles. But we're also seeing that people do like to drive. People do still enjoy it. And, and during the recession, we were broke. And you can't, you can't forget the fact that uh, out of those numbers you showed, a lot of those cars are V6 automatics. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and now they'll be four-cylinder turbo automatics right. in the case of the, the Mustang and the, the next Camaro. But so. even those V6 automatics, I mean, you've got to, you've got to admit that they really drive oh, with, sure. with exactly. Oh, sure, exactly. I mean, you know, yeah. the kind of horsepower they would have loved to have had uh, in those cars 20 or 30 or 40 years ago. Uh, in the V6 or even the four-cylinder turbo, uh, they would have loved to have in the V8 version not that long ago. So... Well, sure. And, and you're, you know, what you're talking about, you got to come out with these special packages. Yeah. Steph, you were at the, G the GT350 debrief. Yeah, this we week. were looking yesterday. at that. Yesterday. Yesterday? Was it yesterday? Jeez, Don't ask me what flies. day it is. Yeah, right. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, this is a serious Mustang. That's a serious Mustang. Um, the, the level of, of different things and differentiation, the differentiation they did with the suspension to make it better, lighter. And, and perform totally better. changed the suspension totally changed geometry. Yep. Mm. They even changed uh, the grill radiator support <laughs> because they wanted to get the nose lower. So, I mean, they even changed part of the structure of the car. Made it out of carbon fiber, too, by the way, to make it lighter. Got the nose down that way. Completely revamped the, the suspension. Yeah, completely. Put on the biggest damn brakes I've ever seen on yeah. anything. God, are those brakes big. And in a construction of which I've never seen before. So there's this cast aluminum hub with these pins sticking out. And then they've got the rotors mounted onto those pins. I've never seen anything it, like it. It's strange. It's and they had a little cutaway. And you pulled it out and the rotor just hangs on the... On those pins. And so, it, and so it's a uh, halo for a halo. The, the, yeah. the Mustang is uh, Ford Motor Company's only rear-wheel drive car. And here you've got a car with, uh, with an all-new suspension, a uh, separate suspension that, that will probably be fabulous to drive. Mm -hmm. Kind of following the Camaro Z28, uh, right. what they did. That and, and Hellcat's a halo for a halo, halo as well. Carbon yeah. fiber yeah. wheels standard yeah. on the yeah. R. And what was also so interesting is they have sprayed on a ceramic coating on the inside of the wheel. So as the brakes get super hot, it they were saying it could get the carbon fiber uh, soft. Mm -hmm. So they put, uh, like I said, uh, they're throwing a lot of technology on this car I've never seen before. Well, and if you look at what, what the company needs to do with, what all companies need to do with light weighting, one of the things you can do with, with looking at this carbon wheel and, and taking it out to this extreme in a place that you can charge for it is evaluate what you could do 10 years down the road with carbon fiber, wheel, fiber wheels and, and really see where you can save money and save weight on things that'll, some of this will, will end up in mass market mm -hmm. down the road. And if, even if it's not the specific item, what they've learned about what they can do and how far they can push things certainly will make a difference in the future. But, you know, it's sort of fascinating, you know, that, as you were mentioning, Todd, that the Mustang is, is Ford's halo car. And if, if you look at Ford car sales so far this year, the focus is up 0.1%. It's, yeah. The um, police interceptor sedan is up 0.7%. And as we mentioned earlier, the Mustang is up 60%. And no other car is in positive territory. Yeah, yeah, all down. So, so you have the halo car, which is actually, actually the uh, almost more than a halo. Well, we were talking before the show a little bit about uh, how important luxury and premium cars are to bottom lines, and um, I think, I think we're entering an age where you've got buyers who have any interest in a car as being anything more than an appliance will either try to buy a premium car or buy an off-lease premium car for the price of a, of a commodity car. And I, and I think cars like the, the, the Ford Mustang fit into that category, even though they're not 
premium cars per se. There's something special. They stand out from the rest of the Ford line, not just because they've got rear-wheel drive. And Ford's also talking about it being a premium car. That You get the premium package on one. We just uh, took delivery of a Four Seasons car at Automobile Magazine, uh, a uh, four-cylinder EcoBoost Turbo with a manual and the premium package, and it's a $36,000 car. It's not, not as expensive as a BMW or anything, but it's not cheap. And, and so this is, I think this kind of fits into that category of something a little bit special for people who buy new cars. If, yeah. if you don't want that, you might as well buy a used car these days. It's Critical reliable. way of keeping a brand healthy and, yeah. and, and going. And speaking of that, we, we've got a phone call here that we've got to bring in because we've got a question about that GT350R. Hey, guys, this is Youngblood, Cleveland, Ohio. All right. Got a question about the new Mustang GT350 and the 350R. I'm reading all kind of specs about it, all kind of blah, blah, blah information, but no horsepower or torque numbers. When do you think that might come out? What's your guess? Is it embargoed? That's a shame. That should be one of the first things they put on the uh, spec sheet. Let me know. Thank you. Good show. Later. Yeah, thanks, Aaron. Glad. You, you don't know automotive PR, do you? I mean, they, they love yeah. to keep that. From so, them. number one, no, we don't have it. I don't have it. I don't. I don't it, it's not embargoed. They simply haven't given it out yet. Uh, I think all they're saying is over 500. But well, when does the car go on sale? This fall. Aha. Uh -huh. What else goes on sale this fall? New Chevy Camaro? New Camaro. New Camaro. So, I mean, uh, there's. Point. They're, they're, you, you're, seeing, you're seeing rivals do this over and over again, saying giving you a vague number over this number, right. and then uh, they're all kind of in an arms race to uh, see who can get the higher number uh, by, the, by the time the car has its official specs. Hmm. They, they, they are probably still tweaking it anyway. They're probably I mean, still the, working on it. They probably don't know the exact number anyway. And um, increasingly we're seeing, especially with specialty cars, more and more bits and pieces being released throughout the, the launch process. So, you know, the effort is to try and keep yeah. us talking about it yep. for the next eight yeah. months. Um, and, and you can't do that if you give us all the information at mm -hmm. one time. Exactly right. Hey, look, uh, we're at the top of the hour. But to end the show, I want to go back to 2009, which is the year that we launched AutoLine After Hours. And one of the very first guests we ever had on this show was Denise McCluggage. Now, we had to Skype her in from uh, New Mexico. And this is when Skype was in its infancy. We were one of the first ones to actually ever bring it into using on a program. So the video is not going to be any good, but the audio is good. And Ben went out and uh, listened through it and pulled out uh, a little soundbite here. It's about a minute and a half long or something like that of Denise talking about cars. And I think it's a great way to end the show. Mm -hmm. So before we go to that, I just want to say, Stephanie Brindley, thanks so much for sure, coming on. Anytime. Todd Lassa, great for having you on the thanks, show, too. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Gary, let's do this again next week. Why don't we do that? <laughs> and why don't we end this with this soundbite from Denise McCluggage. Really what drivers want is torque and range, and they don't know that because they don't know those words. But if you say, well, did your, you know, everybody, anybody talk about a car having good pickup? That's torque. So, oh, yeah, I like that. You get across the intersection, you get up the ramp, you get past the 18-wheeler. Torque, that low-end torque, makes you think you're really, really powerful. And then, as a result of, of your good mileage, you get long range. Nobody I know likes to stop at gas stations. A really, I, my daddy used to wean every car we had. I swore we ran out of gas more than our share of times. But stopping for fuel is just not the happiest thing in the world to do. And that's why ethanol will never be really a success in flex fuel vehicles because you stop so much more often than you do on gasoline. So um, those two things. Torque and range and a nice turning circle. That's all you need. <laughs> this, is, this is why PR people that I know and journalists like you guys love you, Denise. You are a chick that talks cars. <laughs> <laughs> it was great having you talk about diesels because I know it's a personal oh, yeah. passion. Of oh, yours. yes. I, uh, I do like them. Dr. Rudolph and I were close friends, you know. <laughs> <laughs>
Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, your journey, our passion, and by the all-new 2015 Jeep Renegade.